Welcome to Liberty Christian Fellowship. Okay, we're going to read scripture together. Mark is going to introduce our, our uh, text for today. Good evening. We are continuing our investigating the insights of Isaiah. This is lesson number 27. Title of tonight's message, Israel is the center of Christ's millennial kingdom on earth. Pastor Earl will show us how Israel remains a focus of God's attention. Here's something we Christians need to understand. The church has not replaced Israel, but is grafted into Israel, as Romans 11, verses 17 through 24 explains. As Christians, we nonetheless should be encouraged because we too are children of Abraham and are grafted into the promises God will fulfill for Israel. As we read today's scripture slides, I'll read the slide headers and we'll read the passages together. Isaiah 60. God's glory will shine through his people as a light to the nations. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. Lift up your eyes all around, your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters carried on the hip. Then your heart shall thrill and exult, because of the abundance of the sea, the wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and good news, the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar, the rams of Nebioth, shall minister to you with acceptance on my altar. As in the Exodus, God draws Israelites home endowed with wealth. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastland shall hope for me, the ships of Tarshish first, to bring your children from afar, their silver and gold with them. For the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. God's favor on Israel compels the nations to minister to them. Foreigners shall build up your walls, and their kings shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have had mercy on you. Your gates shall be opened continually, day and night, that people may bring to you the wealth of the nations, with their kings led in procession. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. Those who persecuted Israel shall serve Israel. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the plain, and the pine, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious. The sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. God will cause the nations to favor Israel as salvation is of the Jews. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age. You shall suck the milk of nations, you shall nurse at the breast of kings, and you shall know that I, the Lord, and your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. God will bring Israel perpetual peace and prosperity. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold, and instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze, instead of stones, iron. I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. 
God will be Israel's everlasting light and glory. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous. They shall possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. I am the Lord, in its time I will hasten it. Lord God, thank you for your amazing word. We turn this time over to you for your Holy Spirit to use Pastor Earl to speak your truth to us. Thank you for guiding him to mine the treasures of your word and understand the width and height and depth of your love for us. May your truth shine forth and fill our hearts. Please show us why you included these passages in your word. Show us how they reveal who you are and what we can be like because of who you are. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen. All right, we're going to look at four things. In Isaiah 60, 1 through 3, we're going to see that God contrasts what it's like to walk in his light versus wallowing in darkness. Then in Isaiah 60, 12 through 18, we're going to see that those who bless Israel get blessed, those who curse Israel get cursed. Sounds like some promises out of Genesis and Numbers, doesn't it? We're going to circle back then and look at Isaiah 60, verses 4 through 11. We're going to see that God imposes judgment and he imputes righteousness. We're going to see finally that Jesus is Israel's and our anointed, everlasting liberator, light, and comforter. So part one, God contrasts what it's like walking in his light versus darkness. In Isaiah 60, verse 3, it says, Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Next slide. Isaiah 60, 1 through 4, in Christ's millennial reign, Israel will be the focal point of God's light. Now, this, these passages are talking about Israel in the millennial kingdom. A lot of churches are saying that the, uh, that, um, the church has replaced Israel. This Bible passage is talking about Israel. I'm going to explain how Israel will get grace and mercy for that to happen, just like we got grace and mercy to be in Christ. Actually, what's really going to happen is the nations are going to be drawn to God's light, which will shine through Israel. Jesus belonged to what nation? What tribe and group of people? Judah. He was the tribe of Judah, which, was, which, which means he was an Israelite. So salvation is of the Jews. Another way to understand this is that Israel is the focal point of God's light. Now, you're going to have some blanks on your page. The blanks are going to correspond to the blue words up on this screen. You don't have to use those words if you don't want. It's a free country. Put in any words you want. But these are the words I would use. So the Bible says, arise, which means stand up. Be accountable. Which really, which really means allow the light of God's glory to illuminate through us. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. How many conversations have we been in this week where the Holy Spirit might have said, Arise, stand up, say something. Light is a symbol of God's presence. If you have God's presence with you, it tends to mean that you have his favor. He's shining through us, upon us, and through us. Of course, there are times when we have God's presence and he disciplines us as well. So in Christ's millennial kingdom on earth, which I'm going to call the Shemoki, the C-M-K-O-E, <laughs> Christ's millennial kingdom on earth. I'm going to give you some fillings on that next week. <laughs> I like making up these things. Israel will enjoy a position of favor and grace. To shine with glory means that what emanates from us is the honorable representation of God. Some people say, well, I just want to glorify Jesus. And I'm like, we only use like one tenth of the Bible, man. You better, I don't know if you're making a quite an honest, an honorable representation of how God reveals himself consistently from Genesis to Revelation. 
So Israel will experience the grace to operate in God's glory. The Bible says in Ephesians uh, 2, 8 through 9 through 10, For grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one can boast. Has Israel ever been able to keep the law? Not even the ceremonial law. Let alone the, the moral law, the, the eternal moral law, the Ten Commandments. All right. Have you been able to keep, or me, have any of us been able to keep the ceremonial law, the Ten Commandments? I mean, the, the eternal moral law, the Ten Commandments. No. How can we be in Christ? We got grace. Do you think God cannot give the same grace to Israel? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that they should walk in them. In the millennial kingdom, we're looking at what Israel is going to be walking in, which God has prepared beforehand through the prophet of Isaiah. He's announced it through the prophet Isaiah. So Israel's hardening is partial, and it's dispensational, meaning that the hardening will only last for a time, until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. When I was learning to be a, a preacher, a pastor, another preacher told me, he goes, my college professor told me to never talk about anything that has anything to do with dispensations. I said, well, I don't know, 60% of the Bible is the Old Testament, so I guess that you're only going to be preaching 40%. But there's some dispensation in that too, so maybe it'll be a little bit less. Yet you will claim, I believe the whole word of God. You know what the church is in love with? The church is in love with the love of God. I don't think they're in love with the God of the Bible. Anyway, look at Romans 11, 25 through 27. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. It's hard to figure out. Got to have some grace. Holy Spirit's anointing to figure this out. A par brothers, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. It says a partial hardening. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. You know why it's partial? Every church I've ever been in, there's been um, mess Messianic Jews. Every church I've ever been in, there are Jewish people that believe in Jesus. So the hardening is partial. And verse 26, and in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written. The Bible is written in past tense. Jesus Christ died for us in the past. It's, we're, we're walking in it now. We're getting the fruit of it now. We're going to actually get the fulfillment of it in the future. But what happens is Jesus Christ, when we blow it, he doesn't jump down from the cross and go, you know what, dude? You just screwed up. I just done died for you. No, it's all written in past tense. Jesus Christ has redeemed us. I said, think you could lose your salvation. And my wife would say, where'd it go? <laughs> Maybe it's under the sofa. <laughs> and in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. Come from Zion. Come from Zion. People are always trying to, you're going to see a little bit later, that people are always trying to take credit for being in Zion or being of Zion, and they're not. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and their sins will be my covenant, and, I'm sorry, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. When the church says, oh, the church has replaced Israel, we don't believe that God can give Israel the same grace that we got. That's putting God in a box that he doesn't want to be in. You know what the word dispensation means in Webster's 1828 dictionary? The first dictionary of the American English language, which defines most words by how they appear in the Bible, only because we weren't a Christian country. <laughs> it says, dispensation is the distribution, the act of dealing out to different persons or places, the dealing of God to his creatures, the distribution of good and evil, natural or moral, in the divine government. God's methods are not different in his, dif dis in his dispensations to private man. Let me put that in English. God has one plan for the world, and he explained it in both Testaments. The Old Testament gives us the processes of the principles that are in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, Adam sins. God covers him and gives him grace. In the New Testament, we read, God gives us grace. In the Old Testament, Moses sins. He kills a guy. God meets him at the burning bush and gives him grace. Moses tries to uh, waffle out, uh, weasel out of that grace <laughs> by saying, 
God, you're going to send me back to a place where people are seeking my life. And Moses came up with one excuse after another. And the Bible says that, that, that the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. He probably saw that bush flare up and goes, you know what? I ain't going to be able to run from this. <laughs> so then he goes, why well, stutter? Let's send my brother Aaron with me. But we see that God did most of the talking. Although, I'm not going to get into that. There's sort of three miracles with Moses, three miracles with Aaron, and then but we're not going to get into that. Anyway, so this dispensational thing, Webster's 1828 says that God's dispensations, that which is dispensed or bestowed through a system of principles or rites, such as the Mosaic dispensation involving the Levitical law and rites, and then there's the gospel dispensation provided through the redemptive sacrifice of Christ. Now, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in the Old Testament, God says, okay, you're a leper. And um, in, in the early book of Luke, we see that God heals these lepers. And so the, 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 the Jesus tells the lepers, go show yourself to the priest. And what would the, le the priest do in Leviticus chapter 14 to the lepers? Well, the priests have to take two birds. They got to kill one bird under living or running water. And they got to mix that little bird's blood with the water because they got to sprinkle the guy for eight days. Not enough blood and the little bird to last for eight days. But we're washed by the water in the word. We're washed by the blood. So God take, then, then God has the priest take a second, a, a hyssop branch. And he takes that hyssop branch, which is a symbol of the cross. He ties a red thread around it, a symbol of more blood. And he ceremoniously sprinkles, uh, dips the hyssop branch in the blood. And he takes the second bird and he ceremoniously sprinkles it with the blood and he releases that bird into the wilderness. That bird is resurrected through the blood. All the Levitical ceremonies are designed to teach us two of these five things. The minimum one has two of them. But most, like the one I just explained to you, has, has more than that. It has all four, four things. It might have all five. He will be born of a virgin. He will live a sinless, miraculous life. He will die a substitutionary death. He will be bodily resurrected. And he will be seated at the right hand of God. God has one plan for the world, and it's in both testaments. Now, the priests are putting all these people through, this, through these ceremonies, and in Acts 7-1, I believe it is, it says, after Jesus' resurrection, many priests believed. Why? Because as they're putting the lepers through those ceremonies, the healed lepers through those ceremonies, the lepers are saying, Jesus heal me, Jesus heal me, Jesus heal me. So by the time the resurrection comes and everybody's talking about Christ popping out of the grave, many priests believe they got it. The Bible says in Romans 11, 28 through 32, as regards the gospel, Speaking of the Israelites, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, I was elected. Why can't God elect Israel when he so chooses? As regards to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is being faithful to them because he's keeping his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. None of whom were perfect, by the way. They all failed, and they got grace. For the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now you have received mercy because of their disobedience, so too now they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may now receive mercy. God can give, why can't, God can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. He can give Israel mercy and grace just like he gave us mercy and grace. First time somebody told me about Christ, well, for the first 12 times, I ran my mouth and thought I knew something that I didn't know. For God, verse 32, has, confined, has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And that means everybody's got to come by grace. Next slide. So, without God's light, we are wallowing in darkness. Now, this word darkness means that you are in obscurity. You are in spiritually unintelligible ignorance. You ever talk to a sinner and say, dude, you're just acting spiritually unintelligibly ignorant. <laughs> you better shut up and get right with God while you have the chance. 
It says that this obscurity will cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise on you, his people, and his glory will be seen by you. That's why the nations are going to be, it's like a moth on a cold night. It's drawn to the light. They associate the light with warmth. Now, if you are in spiritually in, in unintelligible ignorance, answer this question. Does that mean you can't discern God because you are blinded? What do we sing in Amazing Grace? I once was blind, but now I see. Do I see because I'm such a great guy? Or you're such a great girl? Do you got to go to heaven one day and go, God, this is me. Let me in. You know me. No. We're going to fall on our face on the floor and say, Jesus Christ died for my sins. I once was blind. I had no discernment, but he had mercy on me so I could see. Doesn't mean you're trapped in a negative attitude that is like, you know, the, the attitude of Genesis 6, 5, where God looked down right before the flood and he saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of every thought of his heart was only evil continually. I like to say it this way. That God looked down from heaven and he saw that every intention of man's heart was evil all the time. What are they telling kids in school? What's in the library reading to our children? I got some plans for the next time there's a library reading near us. The way out, if, if we're in spiritually ignorant blindness, if we're in this, if we're in this obscure, spiritually unintelligible ignorance, is this true or false? The only way out is to plead with God to have mercy so that his grace, God's riches, and Christ's expense will elect me for salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, you've got to be saved by grace. It's not going to be by your own works. You can't boast. You can't be smart enough to, 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 to earn it, to obtain it. You've got to have grace. If God is going to use us to, 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 to shed, shine his light at such a time as this, we got to say, God, you know what I am like. I'm perfect in every way. God, you know what I am like. If you don't move in me and work in me, it is not going to happen. Right. Left to my own devices, I'm not doing it. I don't want to pretend with God, oh, I'm something that I'm not. No, I tell God all the time, if you don't work in me, it isn't happening. I always say, ain't. It ain't happening. So you got to work in me and make me the kind of person that you can use at such a time as this. Because left to my own device, I'll just be watching TV. <laughs> Eat Twinkies. <laughs> Count on, take me away. All right. Without being born again by election, we're completely blind and lost. Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone, they are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, they both will fall in a pit. When I was a kid, before I was even a Bible reader, I used to talk trash to people in my neighborhood. I said, look at the two of you, the blind leading the blind, you're both headed for a ditch. I don't even know where I got that from, but it's scriptural. All right, Luke 6, 39. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? Matthew 23, 16. Woe to the blind guy, you blind guys who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, then you're bound by your oath. See, the prosperity gospel is not new. The Bible says there is nothing new under the sun. People are saying, oh, we were in unprecedented times. I'm like, dude. Go look, read the Bible about people taking their children down to the Valley of ben Hinnom and sacrificing them in the fire. All revivals are the same. You've got to study these Old Testament revivals to see where, what we've got to do. All right? Matthew 23, 24, you blind guides, straining out a gnat, swallowing a camel. Matthew 23, 26, you blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup of the plate, that the outside may also be clean. We saw this a couple weeks ago with the woman at the well. If she didn't overcome her spiritual adultery, she has no hope of overcoming her physical adultery. Luke eleven thirty nine, 39, and the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees, clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. I used to be a bodybuilder. My wife used to always try to get me to eat right. One day I was down in the basement exercising. She stood over me and she goes, look at you. You look good on the outside, but I see what you eat. That straightened me out for about two weeks. 
<laughs> oh, she walked away and she goes, well, the insurance at least is paid. I'm like, okay, I got it straight now. <laughs> Isaiah 56.10, his watchmen are blind, they are all ignorant, they are all dumb dogs, they cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. When we went through Isaiah 56, we looked at how useless a non-barking guard dog is. That's a poor watchman. Next slide. In Isaiah 60, verses 4 through 9, we see that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. That's Proverbs 13.22. Lift up your eyes all around. Your son shall come from afar and your daughters carried on the hip. Why does God make that expression? You know when mothers are in peace and safety and they're at the market with their kid, they got the baby on the hip. When mothers are scared, they got the baby wrapped up in their run. God is saying, I'm going to bring peace and safety. Your children will all be carried, your girls will all be carried on the hip. In foreign societies, eastern societies, like in China, they had a one child policy, I think now they got a two child policy, and I met a couple Chinese people and they said, oh gosh, you don't want to have girls. Remember watching the story of watching me? Everybody wanted boys. But God saying, I'm going to change things. In Christ there's no East or West, East or West, there's no Jew or, 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 or Gentile, there's no male or female. The daughters are going to get their respect. Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free. There's no male or female for you. All are one in Jesus Christ. Joel 2.29, in those days I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. I was tracking that this week and I noticed that, uh, I'm trying to think, I think it was during the, 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 king, the, the, the reign of Asa. I don't I'm going to quote the king wrong, but they consulted a female prophetess. Now, I say that to many people, and they'll say, well, that must have been, there's no man, qualified man. I said, the Bible didn't say that. When the Bible calls, when the Bible says that Deborah is judging Israel at that time, it doesn't say, well, there was no qualified man, so Deborah was, I said, stop putting words in God's mouth. He'll use who he wants to use when he wants to use them. What we need to do is shut up and die right so he can use us. Anyway, okay, now. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. They shall bring you gold and frankincense and good news and praises of the Lord. Isn't that going to be amazing? That God is going to give the nation such grace and mercy that they're going to respond appropriately to his Holy Spirit and they're going to treat Israel right. That's kind of cool. All the flocks of Kedar, I can't pronounce that name. Nebiah, uh, what, how, how did you pronounce that? Kedar, Nebiah. Nebiah. You know, those are the sons of uh, Ishmael. You know the Arabs are Ishmaelites, right? The Ishmaelites are going to come and treat Israel with respect. And it says they're going to bring your children from afar and they're going to bring silver and gold with them. That means you're going to get great favor. So we need, whenever God's called me to do something, I say, God, give me favor. Because if I stand in my own strength, nothing's going to happen. Well, it might not be that good, but I'm going to look at you for favor. Look at this, Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the right, for the, the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Continuing this theme in Isaiah 60, 10 through 12, God says, foreigners shall build up your walls, talking to Israel, and their king shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you. We, I'm going to put up some. I'm going to go back to my maps in a couple of weeks and show you how God struck Israel, had them dragged off to Assyria, had them dragged off to Babylon because they idol worshipped. Idol worship is not people. Anybody know anybody that prays to their car? You know anybody that prays to their car? You know anybody that prays to their house? I've been in some fabulous houses. And I've been on four continents. I've been on some nice, pretty nice boats. I don't know one person that prays them to their own oh, boat. You're my, you're my savior. I don't know anybody that does that. I know that they pray to Allah. I know that they pray to Mary. They pray to Peter and St. Christopher and St. This one and Matthew and they pray, and they pray to the, the angels. That's the idols God is talking about. And the church has, we have, we have failed to help our nation and our world stay righteous with God because we have taken 10 commandments number one and 10 commandments number two most for granted. I'm a former English teacher. Whatever's in front, Whatever is mentioned first is the most important because that's the theme that runs through everything else. If you don't know who God is, 10 commandment number one, and you think he's something else, 10 commandment number two, you can't even get saved. Anyway, let's go on, next slide. Now, 
In, in, Gen in Isaiah 16, 60, 12 through 18, you see that God fulfills his promise to Israel from Genesis chapter, beginning in Genesis chapter 12. Those who bless thee, I will bless. Those who curse thee, I will curse. But God is love. He's love, 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 love. Yeah, God is love. He loves Israel. So mess, you mess with what he says he loves, he's going to curse you. He's not going to let that mess in his heaven because he wants to bless us. He wants to love us in heaven. He doesn't want to be dealing with your unsaved, unregenerated mess in his kingdom. He loves you, but he will send you to hell. He loved Israel, but he dragged you off the bondage. He loved America. He had us ragtag people defeat the greatest power on the face of the earth. But we have let go of what God gave us. We have failed to hold on to our Puritan heritage, and now we're getting judged. We're getting cursed. Go read Deuteronomy chapter 28. First 15 verses read like what America used to be like. The next almost 60 verses, 50 some odd verses read like what we're getting now. We can repent. Stop, drop, and roll. Put the fire out. Come back to God. All right, next slide. So, oh, wait a minute. Oh, I got to do this people group thing. This is pretty cool. In Genesis 12, 3, the Bible says to, Ab to Abraham, through you all the nations of the of the uh, of the, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Isn't that a cool statement? All the families of the earth. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue. We look at Revelation 5, 9 and 7, 9. It says, you were, you were slain by the blood. You ransomed people of God from every tribe and language and people and nation. I don't care who you are. I know that your parents made a terrible mistake by bringing you to the mosque. Bring it to the Jewish temple or bring it to the Catholic. I don't care who you are. You can come out of that. Revelation 7, 9. Behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. You know what? For that to be fulfilled, God has to use us to fulfill the good works that he's prepared beforehand. With the people that say, we, that, that we're, they're trying to convince us we need to be tolerant. And don't, men, when people say to me, well, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Muslim. And I'm like, well, I'm giving you a chance to repent of that. Oh, I'm Catholic. I'm giving you a chance. I go on autopilot. I just say, because it spits out of my mouth. I'm giving you the chance to repent of that. For, for this verse to be true, the Lord has to work success through that ministry. It ain't about me. All I got to do is open my mouth. Let him do his work. Our challenge is we keep tolerating what won't tolerate Christ. Be done with that. Next slide. Now, God's God makes these promises to Israel because he's safeguarding the people through whom his salvation will come. Why does God move us into these unusual places? How do we get in and out of life? God is safeguarding the people through whom his salvation will come. Paul said to the Corinthians, I was amongst you in weakness and fear and trembling. Who in their right mind would put themselves in such a position? I wouldn't. God had to force me to do a lot of things that I, that I have done. I did not discern them. I'm like, they don't make any sense. People say, are you out of your mind? I'm like, nope. I'm not in my right mind, and I'm not out of my mind. I'm in the mind of Christ. So Genesis 12, 3, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, I gotta say one thing, I'm telling my notes here, but I gotta say this. Four of the most important words in the Old Testament, or in the entire Bible, are in Genesis 11, 30. And Sarah was barren. Genesis 11.30. It's giving you the history of Abraham's family. And it says, and Sarah was barren. Genesis 12.1, God comes to Abraham and says, I want you to go, I'm going to make you into a great nation. How can that? That does not make any sense. I was a baby Christian reading the Bible. I kept flipping the page back. Wait a minute. How can that happen? Sarah's barren. We're all Sarah's. Every last one of us is barren. And unless you begin to operate with God in your barrenness and through your barrenness and let God work through your barrenness, nothing is going to happen. 
If you only go in places where you feel strong and where you feel secure and you feel all about yourself, nothing is going that well. Some things may happen. I don't want to put God in the box. But God puts people in unusual circumstances. If you imagine Abraham, he's got his camels packed and all the, he's there having his last barbecue with the guys in the neighborhood. And they're like, and they're all sitting there having their final whatever, drink beer, soda, beer, whatever. And, 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 and they're like, dude, now let me get this right. God told you what? Which God? The tree God, the frog God, the moon God, the snake God, the what God? The sun God? Told you he's gonna make you into a great nation. Dude, your wife is barren. Abraham is a great man of obedience because he went and did what God told him, but he is a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous man of faith because he took his barren wife with him. Isaiah 60 says this. The whole chapter is really about this. God imposes judgment and he imputes righteousness. In both the um, I'm not, okay, yeah, thank you, Bill. In both the Old and New Testament, everyone fails, but they get God's grace. Israel also rejected God, but they get grace. It's grace upon grace upon grace. Get over yourself. Get into God's grace. Every time God calls us to do something, we read God our crummy resume, right? Oh, I'm not this. I ain't do that. I should be this. Nah, nah, nah. No, stop. God knew your crummy resume before He called you. Get over yourself. Get into grace. You look in the mirror and say, God, I sense you're calling me to some things. I don't know why, don't quite understand it, but I believe your grace is sufficient and you can do this even through me. I would not call me, but if you're calling me, I'm going to answer the call. So those who have replacement theology that says the New Testament and the contemporary church has replaced Israel, they're gravely mistaken. They are misrepresenting God's intentions through his revealed word. God can straighten out Israel when he feels like it. Next slide. Now, God imposes justice on Israel's imposters. In, in Isaiah 60, verse 12, it says, For the nation and the kingdom that will not serve you shall perish. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. We have nations within nations. We have people groups within people groups. We have people who make side deals. We have people who have meetings outside the meetings, and they're ruining our country. But look what God says about these liars in, in Revelation 3, 9. This is an NIV. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan. I once asked a Jesuit, I said, what are you doing? You're the society of Jesus, for crying out loud. And he goes, well, if we call ourselves a society of Satan, do you think we'd get very far? <laughs> Revelation 3, 9. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim, that means they make a non-committal affirmation. Oh, I'm a Zionist. But they're not committing to God. What is Zionist? They're not committing to the Bible. They're liars. They speak falsely to deceive people, to deceive us. And God says that of, the, of these people making these non-committal, claiming these non-committal fraudulent rights, who claim to be Jews, but are not, there's some people always calling and saying, the Jews are doing this, the Jews are saying, you better read your Bible, dude. I'm not saying all Israelites are perfect. No, they're sinners. I'm going to hell. But you have to be discerning. There are a lot of people that are running around, the Reds, the Roosevelts, the Rothschilds, these people, the Red, they all name themselves after Harry Red Guy Esau. Trying to blame everything, all their mess on the Jews. God says they are those who call themselves Jews, but they are not. They make this fraudulent claim, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, speaking to Israel, and acknowledge that I have loved you. They are not Israel. You with me? Let's go to the next slide. I only got two or three more. Well, I got five, not really. We're going to be some scripture. <laughs> we're going to be done by 8 o'clock. <laughs> Isaiah 60, verses 17 through 18. God will bring Israel perpetual peace and prosperity. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. What? It keeps repeating. It's like, so first it's iron and a stone. He's bringing, he's taking. What's that all about? I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land, devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation. And that means a victorious deliverance. And your gates will be called praise. You know the word Judah means praise, adoration. So God will give Israel grace to finally get some decent overseers and taskmasters. 
God, please give America grace so we can get some of those decent overseers and taskmasters in our government. You know, in Egypt, Israel had taskmasters and overseers that said, oh, so Moses wants you to go out into the wilderness and worship God? <laughs> You're not getting any more brick to, uh, straw to make brick. Go find your own straw and you better keep up your quota of bricks. How's that for a taskmaster? The Bible says in Psalm 22.3, in the King James Version of the Bible, and the, the American Standard, not the New American Standard, the ASB, I think it's 1901. It says, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. God inhabits the praise of his people. The Bible says, give thanks for all things. Not all things are good, in my opinion, but the Bible says, give thanks for all things. Why? Because if you don't, you'll stop walking in the way God wants you to walk through that mess. There's a godly way to go through everything. And the first step is praise. All right, now listen. All of the translations say that God is enthroned on the praises of Israel. I like to think of it as he inhabits the praise. All right, now, the concept that God inhabits the praise or that he's enthroned is, is a reference to the cherubim in the ark, of the Ark of the Covenant. In Eliot's commentary for English readers, it says the ever-ascending praises of his people become a throne for the divine king, and they take the place of the outstretched wings of the, of the cherubim. See, this is where the church keeps getting these things like, well, well the church has replaced Israel. Eh. God will call Israel to praise him when it's time. I got a whole bunch of Bible verses on that, but I'm going to move on. Now let me say this about this, this whole thing. Remember we read where God says, I will, I will bring you iron, and then I'll bring you gold, then I'll bring you silver instead of wood, I'll bring you bronze instead of this. All right, here's what that means in verse 17 of chapter 60. It means that um, the articles of blessing, and God says, I will bring you the articles of blessing versus the implements of war. Um, instead of bronze, which is a really strong material for weaponry, I'm going to bring gold. Instead of iron, I'll bring silver. And then God switches it up and says, I will bring you sturdier building materials too. Instead of wood, I will bring you bronze. Instead of stones, I will bring you iron. It's all about the intention of the people for who are bringing it. Let's go to the next slide. Now in Isaiah 60, 19 through 22, Jesus is Israel's anointed everlasting liberator, light and comforter, and he's ours too. Just because he's ours doesn't mean he's forgotten them. I don't understand how people can take the whole chapter of Romans 11 out of the Bible and just like say these things. The church has replaced Israel. You know why? Because we're in love with prosperity. We're in love with the blessings. We want to claim Israel's blessings. A lady called me up yesterday. She said, I went to two churches past two Sundays. and one church, the pastor's wife stood up and she said, I'm in love with money. And money is in love with me. She goes, I can't go back there. I said, start looking at our screen here. Download the notes. Get your posse in your living room. We'll be your pastors. All right. Revelation 22, 5. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. You ever go to our website and you look at um, some of the, the, pray, the song Praise City under music? Pray city, ooh, looks so pretty coming down. You don't need a light there, for Jesus, he outshines the day. I feel like it's hard to sing it. But anyway, all right, so Jesus is the light. Next slide. And, and the church has not replaced Israel, but is grafted into Israel. We haven't been, we haven't replaced it. We've just been grafted in. The church is inserted into Israel so that two living elements, this is what it means to graft the branch, you know, branches together. So these two living elements, Israel and the church, we thrive together. The word grafted also means you take two redeemed ethnic groups, the redeemed ethnic group of the Old Testament, which were the Israelites, and the New Testament believers from every tribe, nation, and tongue, 
You combine them together into one people of God. Now, in the Old Testament, there are a lot of groups of people that are attaching themselves to Israel. The first attachment we see in, as in the Exodus, they call them the rabble. A bunch of Egyptians and people who were enslaved in Egypt and all these tribes, they, they, they attach, these people attach themselves to Israel and they go out into the desert and call them the rabble. <laughs> That's kind of bad news for Israel. Hey, then you've got Rahab. Rahab becomes a rehab. Israel's going to knock down the walls. of God's going to knock down the walls of Jericho. And he tells the Israelites, you go and send two spies. And they say, okay, we're going to spy out the land. The spies do nothing that's related to the battle plan. God didn't send those spies to go scope out the land. He sent those spies to get Rahab. So she could become in the bloodline of Jesus Christ. To be grafted in, Webster's 1828 says this really cool statement. The heathen, the idol-worshiping pagan Gentiles, unacquainted with the true God, who become Christians are admitted into fellowship with the Hebrew people of the Messianic ethnicity. Isn't that cool? Meaning for whom the Messianic salvation originally was intended and ultimately is destined. God has not replaced the church with Israel. He's, he, 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 God, God can walk and chew gum. He can take care of Israel and the church. You got those feelings? Can I move on? I can't trust Speedy over here. Anybody else still lagging? <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. It, it, we're, gonna, we're, we're just about done. Isaiah 60, verses 19 through 22, both Israel and the church benefit from salvation. They benefit from being grafted in by grace. So that they, we get, and they get, God's perpetual light. Verse 19, the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall, shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light. You don't need a light there, for Jesus, he outshines the day. I still can't say it. All right, now, look at the three things that happen if we participate in God's grace. You get perpetual light. You get your grief mollified. Your grief and mourning is gone. You, you people shall be all, shall all be, how can all of us be righteous? Right? We have, that's an imputation. That's Romans 4. God is imputing righteousness to those people. See, he's got one plan. It's all through Isaiah, it's all through Romans. It's all through the Bible. God's got one plan. He's got to redeem us by grace. We, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, all of us are sinners hands of an angry God. But for grace, right? So the, the beautiful thing about this, why is God doing this? Is so he can glorify himself. It's so he can be glorified. So he can shine through us. Now look at this next slide. Revelation 22, 1 through 3. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city also. On either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. I wanted to unpack that. The tree of life has a fruit for each month. Maybe we got to keep eating it to stay there. I'm not sure. I didn't research it. This is throwing us out, which is probably not the right thing to do. All right? The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. No kid will be afraid in the dark. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Next slide. Revelation 22. Uh, 23, 27. Let's read this together. And the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never shut up by day. There will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, 
nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The testable.